Okay, let's try this again. This is the second semester of HVAC design, which you have the privilege of taking before the first semester of HVAC design. But hey, we do this, we don't make one semester, you don't have to take the first one before the second one. So I'll spend a little more time doing introductory stuff and it'll be okay. I mean, it's okay every time. So don't get all upset about that. Um, I'm not gonna really read this. Did, did, did you guys get copies of this? Hopefully, <laughs> shake your head yes, thank you. Uh, all right, so, you know, we got some prereqs and all that good stuff. Um, this is some stuff that we hope to uh, uh, learn during the semester. Uh, we're gonna look at some um, fairly specific stuff related to HVAC systems and design. Um, we'll look at air control. We'll look at um, primary secondary uh, pumping systems. We'll look at some on pump selection, uh, cooling towers, cooling tower selection. Uh, we got some software that hopefully uh, you're in process of downloading that we'll be working with uh, through the semester. The carrier uh, hourly analysis program is really pretty good um, and it's not too hard to learn. I uh, may get to go over a, a little example today or uh, next time. So we'll get fired up here pretty quick. Um, you know, we'll talk some about codes. Uh, ASHRAE 62 ventilation code is huge in the industry. ASHRAE 90.1 is the uh, energy efficiency code. I'm gonna have some uh, little links to YouTube videos that I'll send you so you can, you know, just listen to in some cases they're five minutes, in some cases they're 15 or 20, but you know, experts in the field talking about these things, just to kind of get you up to speed a little bit. <clears throat> uh, I don't know, I guess it all comes down. To, there's topics to be covered. Um, cooling towers, absorption chillers, uh, just all kinds of good stuff, not everything. And then um, we'll have some short quizzes. So I think what I'm gonna do is assign you uh, like three or four of these YouTube videos, and then I'll make up a little, uh, you know, a quick true false or multiple choice quiz. Just, you know, not trying to make it, not trying to make it difficult at all. Just trying to, you know, I've been, I've been at this long enough to know if there's a quiz at the end, people tend to do more stuff than if there's not a quiz at the end. It's funny how that works, you know? Uh, so we'll have some short quizzes along the way. Probably two exams in class. Uh, you will have a project have to do with, uh, you know, probably running some hydronic pipe and air control and uh, pressure loss and size and picking a pump and, you know, just good practical uh, stuff. Maybe a little bit on duct design, we'll see. Uh, final exam. And, you know, I publish Everybody always wants to know about the grade situation. So, I mean, I publish 90, 80, 70, 60, but usually depends on the course, but most of the time I drop down a little bit. I'm not that hard and fast. Like if you got 89.93, you get an A, you know? Now, if you got 87.62, uh, you know, it depends. It depends on what the rest of your peers do. If you're 87.62 and you're the highest grade in the class, you get an A. But if, if all of your buddies have 97 averages and you come in with an 87, you're gonna get a B. You know, so it depends. I mean, from one semester to the next, you, you know, I just 90, 80, 70 just is a little too rigid for me. I mean, I'm gonna do nothing but give you a little bit higher grade than that might indicate in most cases, in some cases, you know, but that, that's not a hard and firm promise either. I mean, it depends on how everybody does uh, on the grading as we go through, but I generally don't get a lot of complaints at the end. So, I, you know, you do this long enough, you kind of come up with a system that you feel like is pretty fair you know, for everybody. So anyway, unless there's questions, we'll go ahead and move on from that. And so I think I sent out this introductory PowerPoint. And so this is where I just kind of ramble for a while. Let me see, display. 
Okay. And <clears throat> so this is, I don't know if I'll go all of this class or it could be this class and part of the next class, but this is what I'm just trying to just have a conversation with you about this field of HVAC and HVAC design. Since this is probably your first foray, I don't know, has anybody co-opt? Sometimes I get people that have a background, you know, working out in the industry per se, but generally speaking, not. So I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go slow and um, we may even uh, uh, write some stuff on some slides here, or uh, I would encourage you to, take some notes uh, or, you know, just to get some of these concepts uh, down, stuff that you could go back and uh, maybe look up a YouTube video or do something to get some additional background. And uh, a lot of times this is stuff that we will, this is stuff that we talk about in the first course as well, but, you know, fundamental. So, okay, so when you do HVAC design, you basically have the heating situation when it's cold outside and you have the cooling situation, you know, in the summertime, it's 90, 95 degrees, 97 degrees. And, you know, you got a building that's loaded up with people and the sun's are shining and the winds are blowing and all this sort of thing. And so the idea of this is to start talking about, and, and the cooling load is at least in our climate, you know, we're kind of in the South you know, not far south, but you know, it's pretty warm around here in the summer. Now it does get cold occasionally. We consider cold, what, 20, 30 degrees. You go up to Minnesota, ah, they're running around in t-shirts, you know, and we're sitting there freezing to death. So it's a little bit relative. So, I mean, a lot of my comments are probably targeted to a climate like ours. It could be up into Kentucky and further north, further south, that sort of thing. But you know, if you went to Las Vegas or Phoenix, then some of these comments would probably get modified a little bit. Okay. But the, the, the main concepts are still there. Well, okay, so you got this hot day, you're sitting in your office, whatever working, could be in the new building across the street. And, you know, um, we got to have air conditioning or it's going to get hot. Well, what are the different individual sources? Where does that heat come from? You know, and when you go through a detailed loads calculation like this software that I sent you will do, it calculates most of these components individually. So it will estimate the cooling load from lights, okay? It will estimate the cooling load from computer. If we were doing this classroom, what do we have? We have lights. I've got this little computer, which isn't much. There's another computer over here. We've got two projectors. And so all of the energy that goes into those projectors turns into heat in the classroom. And so if this is an air conditioning situation, which it's not, it's actually a little cool in here today, but you know, we're pretending we're in the heat of the summer. So all of that energy that goes into light, you know, maybe a few of those photons get out the window, but not very many you know, the vast majority of them, you know, get absorbed by something in here and that turns into heat, okay? And that has to be cooled away if, if uh, we're trying to maintain a, uh, a nice cool temperature in the summertime. So we have, and, and people, okay? So people bring, this brings up an interesting um, situation because people create not only what we call sensible heat, which is going to put energy directly into the air that's going to increase the temperature. But every time we exhale, even through a mask, we're putting out moisture. Okay, so in cooling load calculations, we actually have two components and, oh, I don't know, I'll probably trash up my slides here, but whatever. Uh-oh, that wasn't good. What did I do? Oh, I stopped share, didn't I? Dead gum it. The way to screw up, I'll find it. Oh, see, I was trying to hit this little A thing and oh, I got it that time, maybe. No, crap, well, maybe I won't. So uh, anyway, for, for all of these cooling load components, you need to 
think about whether they are sensible or latent. Latent, we mean moisture going into the space. So the majority are sensible, right? I mean, if I put electricity into that projector and it gets hot, there better not be any moisture generated in it. Okay, so that's a sensible load. But people, and you know, sometimes you may have a big building and you know how architects love to build monuments to themselves. In the lobby, they like to put this big water thing and they like to spray water up in the air and they got some guy with his bones hanging out or something, <laughs> you know, with his bow and arrow up there. And, uh, you know, so that water evaporates and that puts moisture into the space. So we have different sources, uh, a kitchen. If you're doing, uh, say, design on a kitchen for a restaurant, well, you've got coffee pots in there. I mean, you're boiling water on the stove. You're doing all kinds of stuff with water. You got steam. You may have a steam cooker and you open that thing and, you know, a big burst of steam comes out. So those are all latent loads and those are separate calculations. And, you know, especially in the software, these days people don't hardly do load calculations by hand. Okay, that's why this uh, hourly analysis program will really be your friend. And it's, by the way, it's a $2,500 gift from the university pays like 200, 300 bucks a year for the ability to give you the right to download that. And you can take that with you. Now you can't get upgrades and you know, it gets upgraded every year or so, but that version that you download is yours and it's not tied to any sort of a license server. Once you get it on your computer, it's yours forever. So. It's, uh, it's certainly worth having and, and learning. You'd be surprised. I mean, you can, in all, in other different subject areas, sometimes there's a way that you can run a calculation that will help you. So we'll look at that more later. Okay, so we've got latent and sensible loads and we've got internal, called internal heat generation. And so that's, you know, heat sources within the space. So we, everybody in the classroom, uh, is a, a source of internal heat generation because we're all given off. You sitting there at that desk, the tables would say you're given off about 200 BTUs an hour sensible and maybe 150 BTUs an hour of latent. And when you get to the program, the program has, you put in activity levels and it will, it has some standard numbers built into it. I think the, the highest level is like dancing or athletics or something and it gets up like 1200 BTUs an hour you know you're out there playing basketball or something sweating and all this stuff so it depends what you're doing but so if you look at that picture you got equipment lights and people um, are all internal loads so that would be under the heading of internal generation well but that's not all the heat that can that can get in there right if this is um, if that's a slab sitting on grade, it's possible for heat to come in through the floor. Now in cooling load calculation, usually the ground is gonna be cooler than the interior space or certainly the same. So on, on a cooling situation, the floor load is sometimes even neglected. It depends if there's, if there's something, um, say this could be second floor and down below could be a boiler room that stays at 100 degrees. And so if you were doing that, yeah, you would want to account for the heat that's gonna come through because that boiler room is gonna be hot all the time, you know, during the summertime. But if it's a slab on grade, it's probably not gonna be anything. Uh, and then you've got, it shows a partition wall over there on the right. Okay, so in your models, if there's no heat transfer through the wall, then it's basically not there. I mean, all, all we're concerned with is heat transfer that's gonna lead us to sizing, air conditioning and heating equipment. And so if there's no heat transfer through it, well, screw it, forget it. You know, those are your favorite ones. You don't have to put them in. <laughs> you, you just get to, uh, you know, go by. So for example, on that roof load, if that was my office, which is right behind this wall, um, on top of it is conditioned space, right? I got the third floor of Brown. Well, so I don't think the temperature on the third floor is much different than the temperature on the second floor over my office. 
So if I was modeling my office, I wouldn't put the roof in because there's no heat transfer through it. Now, if I was on the fourth floor, if I was doing like Connor Murray's office, who's on the fourth floor, electrical engineering, you know, um, support person, when you go through his roof, if you drill long enough, you get to the outside. So he's got a roof load. So you would put Connor's roof in the model for his office, but Glenn's right next door, you would not. So you're only gonna include walls and surfaces that experience a net heat transfer either into or out of the space, okay? <laughs> okay, and then we get over on the side where the sun's shining and we see that we've got uh, a window over there. Well, so that window, when we go to calculate that window load, we actually do two separate calculations. We're gonna do a solar glass load, assuming that the sun is shining in. Now in the programs, um, you can put a cloud number, you know, you can, you can modify, like if it's always cloudy, like in Seattle, I don't know, the sun hardly shines in Seattle, maybe you, maybe you modify that with a cloud cover number, but you know, around here, there's plenty of days where the, there's no clouds. And so if you're sizing equipment, you're looking for the peak, you know, do I, do I have to put in 10 tons or 15 tons or 20 tons for this particular space in order to be able to keep it cool when it's the hottest outside that I expect it to be, you know, whatever my design condition is. So um, you would do a solar glass calculation, and then you would do what's called a conduction glass calculation, which is just heat conducted through the glass based on it's 95 outside, it's 72 inside. I've got an HA delta T, you know, or a UA delta T is what I've got 95 outside. I've got a convection coefficient on the outside of the glass. I got the glass itself. I got a convection coefficient on the inside of the glass. And then I've got the 72 degrees. And you've done those heat transfer calculations. And I don't know, I'm probably not gonna make you do it again because you've already done it, you know, and that's not the purpose of this class. And eight, believe me, practicing heat HVAC engineers are not out there drawing those little thermal circuits. They're describing their window in the software and the software, bam, gives you the glass load, you know. And this software has been out there a long time. And i not, you know, they always make, uh, Oh, they always make uh, changes and this, that, and the other, but the basic stuff is pretty well proven, you know. So that's, so we have the uh, uh, solar glass load, which is the, like the direct beam through it. And then we have the conduction. And there's also indirect beam that gets uh, included. For example, you know, the sun shines and the, the, some of the radiant energy hits Bruner Hall and there's windows over there and some of it bounces off and comes back over here. You know, it's not all direct beam. So that gets included in the software as well. There's direct beam, there's indirect beam solar, um, and they can be modified with cloud numbers if you want. They can be modified with shading numbers. Like, you know, we have these kind of solar shades uh, on the windows. And so in the software, you can put shading. Now, you, have, you know, the design engineer has to be careful because the architect may draw shades on the window, but, you know, six months later, the, the tenant, whoever owns the building may say, man, I hate those shades, they're coming down. So you downsize the HVAC equipment because you expect shades, and then the owner occupier of the building takes the shades down, and then the sun comes in and you go, oh crap, I can't, I don't have enough cooling. So, you know, the design engineer always has to think about, well, what's the worst case scenario? You know, I mean, and you don't know things like uh, uh, equipment load. You know, you don't, in a general building, I mean, people might bring in a bunch of uh, computer stuff and load up a room. Well, you know, I mean, how much, are, how much of that are you going to allow for something you don't know about? And so, you know, it seems like all of this is real cut and dried, but uh, you can get into some pretty sticky situations. And so, um, 
One thing to always note is if you're actually doing this is document, document, document. Emails, uh, letters, notes, you know, it's not, not enough to just have a conversation. You know, you need to document it with an email because then if something comes up and not very often, but they, so these things come up and they wind up in courts of law. I've been sued. <laughs> I was involved in a two and a half year lawsuit over a big, uh, a pretty good sized motel here in Cookville. And man, I'll tell you, I mean, I didn't write a check, but uh, there was checks written and it wasn't anything I did. It was uh, basically a uh, building leaked. They put drive it, you know, the exterior surface covering and it wasn't put on correctly and water leaked into the building. And you get water behind vinyl wall covering and stuff like that and mold starts growing and they rip off the wall covering and it's covered with black mold which has health implications and it's in a motel <laughs> and they start ripping off all the wallpaper in a five-story motel and you know pretty soon it starts running into some money and then you know what, what what do the lawyers do they sue everybody everybody is guilty and it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a heck of a deal. So, you know, there's, there's all, you, you know, if you're going to get into something like this, I mean, it's just part of the business, but you have to have insurance. You have to have professional liability insurance, you know, a million, $2 million. I know we were involved in the uh, Carwell Mechanical was involved in that here in that suit. And, it, you, you know, they had a $20 million insurance policy they had the biggest insurance policy. So you know who the uh, uh, attorneys focused on? Car wire mechanical. It didn't have anything to do with wh why does this building have a problem? Car wire mechanical didn't put the drive it on the outside of the building, but they tried their damnedest to hang it on car wire mechanical. That's right, it's all dollars. I'll tell you what, if you've ever been crosswise in a a legal situation. I mean, being a lawyer seems all nice and sweet and good until you get across the table from one and they start trying to depose you and ask you questions. Well, Dr. Cunningham, was it the standard of care when you, when you ran those loads? We want copies of your load sheets for those buildings. Did you take everything into account? You know, and we had, um, what did we have? We had continuous ventilation out of the rooms. And they said, oh, well that put negative pressure on the room, it was like 30 CFM. Crap, I can blow 30 CFM out of the rooms. And they, and they tried to blame that for the uh, water behind the uh, vinyl wall covering. And then they had a problem because we went down to the stairwells on the ends of the buildings and the stairwells didn't have any ventilation. They didn't have any conditioning, they didn't have any ventilation, but they still had mold. Well, if it's my exhaust fans, then how come that stairwell has the same mold that the rest of the building has? Oh, well, Dr. Cunningham, I'm just the attorney. I'm asking the questions. You're not. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Um, okay, so the sun also shines and hits the wall. Let me see. Can I, I do do this? Okay, put my little marker. Yeah, I can turn, turn my little marker on. Visible, there we go. Okay, so the sun's gonna shine and hit this wall. And typically that wall has some mass to it. It has some insulation on it. And, and so, you know, when the sun first starts hitting that, that exterior surface is relatively cool and it's gonna heat up. But the inside surface of that wall is not going to heat up immediately, right? It's going to take some time for that thermal energy that's absorbed on the surface to work its way, increase the, the temperature as it goes, to finally increase the inside surface temperature, which then has a convection coefficient on it. And eventually, that energy starts getting into the air, which then affects the temperature in the space but there's a time lag, okay? Now, probably the, the most uh, extreme case of this would be a cave, 
let's say you're down in a cave 100 feet under the ground and the sun shines on the surface of the earth 100 feet above you. How long does it take that energy to affect the temperature in the cave? Forever. Because <laughs> caves almost never change temperature. You know, maybe what, three or four or five degrees from the heat of the summer to the cold of the winter or something like that. And say, that's what you would call pretty massive construction, like 100 feet of earth over your head. That's pretty massive. Okay. So that's the extreme example on one side. The extreme example on the other side is a metal building. Let's say we just put a metal building up up here. It may have a couple inches of insulation on the inside. And you got an air conditioner, but you're in there, say, working on your car. You know, you build you a nice shop and you air condition it, you know. You, you won the lottery, so you know you can build you a 1,500 square foot shop and you're in there with your hoist and just having a big old time. Well, that sun hits the side of that building. It's just got a, 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 a piece of metal and a little bit of insulation. How long does it take that energy to affect the temperature inside that metal building? 10 or 15 minutes? You know, not long. So see, that's the other extreme. And so the massiveness of the construction affects the timing of the energy that comes through the walls that gets released into the space. So that's kind of like the mass effect on uh, the cooling load. And in the program, you put in a mass number for the exterior walls. I think it's minimum number is like 30 what is it, pounds per square foot of wall area? I don't know, it's some funky unit. But, you know, real lightweight's about 30, and I think the, the highest is like 130, 140. I think 130 is the highest. And so you just have to kind of on a relative scale, or I guess you could actually get the plans and try to do a calculation. But, I mean, I usually think about <clears throat> a stone, heavy duty masonry type construction. Like, you know, this building, there's, you know, it's pretty old. There's not a lot of insulation, but it's brick and block, right? You see the concrete blocks and there's brick on the outside of them. There may be a little bit of insulation in between, but it's still pretty massive construction. You know, concrete block, those are probably heavy duty concrete blocks and brick and all that sort of thing. Compared to like a stud wall at my house, I've just got stud walls, insulation, sheetrock and, you know, like vinyl siding on the outside of it, you know, so a couple of layers of paneling, that sort of thing. But it's not near as massive as this wall. So see, you, you have to, um, when you use the software, you have to estimate the massiveness of construction. And what it does is it adjusts the timing on how quickly that energy that hits the outside surface actually gets into the air and has to be cooled away by the HVAC equipment. So we got that going on. And let's see, the other thing we need to think about, so if you look at this little space, you never knew there was so much in this one little picture, did you? <laughs> um, let's assume that over here, that this is the east. Let's just say that, you know, this, it says partition wall, but we can pretend that's an outside wall. And so this would be the west. We're looking at the south and the north wall is behind us, okay? So if you took a vector off of those walls, the one over here would point east. This one is gonna point west. This one on the front is gonna to point towards us to the south and the one on the back is gonna point away from us to the north. Okay, now think about the sun path around this building. So, the sun rises in the east, right? And in Cookville, in the dead of summer, it actually is a little bit north of east, but it depends where you are as you move you know, up and down. But roughly the sun rises in the east. So early in the morning, unless it's shaded by another building, then this side over here on the right is gonna get the east sun and this guy over here on the west is going to get no sun, and the south is going to get no sun, and the north is going to get no sun. 
So, and when the sun first pops up, it's just barely above the horizon, right? And so those rays that come in, they're going to come in almost perpendicular to that wall. So there's not going to be a lot of reflection initially. Now, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, what the sun is moving around towards the south, and it's going up in the sky. So two things are happening. The angle of incidence into that east wall is changing, and we're starting to get some on the south. Okay, at, at noon, solar noon, then that's when the sun is highest in the sky. So you've got more reflection and it's, it's coming in from the south. Okay, so it's bombarding that south wall. Okay, now the east has already had its big shot of solar energy. It's now shaded. And the other thing you have to consider this is what's happening to the outside air temperature. To say early in the morning, it's cool. So it may be 70, 75 degrees. That east wall is getting bombarded, but it's not so hot outside, okay? Sun moves around 9, 10, 11, 12. Temperature's going up. Maybe we're going to 95, so maybe we're in the mid 80s at 12 o'clock noon. And so now we're bombarding that south wall, but we do have more of an angle, so we get, we get some more reflection off of it. Maybe not quite so much comes in, but the air temperature is up in the 80s. Well, and then the sun path continues around that building until we get over here to the west. And, and as we get further into the day, the sun starts falling from solar noon, then it gets lower and lower in the sky, which means the radiation becomes more direct the air temperature is going up. By the time we get around to this uh, west side of the building, it's 95 degrees. It's four o'clock in the afternoon, and we're pretty much hitting that east side. You know, it's getting pelted pretty good with solar radiation. So all things being even, which one of these walls is going to see the most intense loads? Oh, the west because it's going to hit the same it's going to hit the same the sun's lowest which means it's more direct and the outside air temperature is highest so the west zone so if you had identical offices like this say say this is this is the one that's on the west side of the building and you had one that was just like this on the east side of the building the west hvac system would need a little more capacity than the one on the east because of that movement of the sun around the building so movement of sun around a building is critical. You got to get the, and, and when you use the software, you have to position these zones. I mean, it, it wants to know when you put a wall in, it wants to know what direction is that normal point coming off of that wall. And in the carrier, you can, the best you can do, you can adjust it every 30 degrees. You can do north, northwest, north, northwest, something like that. I think that's every 30 degrees you can adjust it. Some software you can actually put in the angle, you know, you can punch an angle, but the carrier, you can't punch an angle, but you can get pretty close. Okay, <clears throat> how are we doing here? It's gonna take all semester to get through this one slide deck, isn't it? <laughs> now we get moving pretty quick here in a minute. Let me see, is there anything else on that? No, nah, I think that's pretty good. I, I would encourage you all to think about this stuff. We'll have some, we'll be working with the software, but you might want to come back and listen to this uh, discussion just to make sure that you pick up on all these concepts. Okay, so here's, uh, these are just some different uh, screenshots that I have put in just to kind of spur uh, discussion. <clears throat> So this is what a three-story building, uh, if you count down in the basement, I guess four stories. Uh, we're showing uh, some, some HVAC equipment and this will show up on some of this, but these are RTUs, okay. What, any idea what an RTU would stand for? That's a rooftop unit, an RTU with 
ERV, Energy Recovery Ventilators. Now that's, uh, ERVs will be one of the uh, YouTube videos that I ask you to, uh, to watch here in the coming days. Uh, energy Recovery Ventilator basically uh, is just a heat exchanger. And in spaces that have to have a lot of ventilation air due to the code, for example, um, well, this classroom, I mean, if you, if you look now, not COVID, but if you just count the chairs, what do we got? Four, eight, 12, 16. Oh, I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, 38, 48. What is that? 54. So if we put somebody in every chair, I think we'd have roughly 54 people in here. Well, when we look at ASHRAE 62, it's going to require someplace in the range of um, probably 10 CFM per person, at least of ventilation air. Well, so let's just say we had 50 people times 10, that's uh, 500 CFM, and that's just in this space. So if you had, you know, a good size an RTU that's doing this end of the building, it might have, you know, 5,000 CFM of outside air. Whew, you know what a load that is? 95 degrees outside, you're gonna bring 5,000 CFM of outside air in. Whoo hoo, you're talking some capacity. You're talking some energy cost. You're talking some first equipment cost. So they have these deals called ERVs, energy recovery ventilators. So what they do is if you're gonna use a, uh, an ERV, you would pull all of that exhaust air because when you're putting it in, you gotta pull it out. Okay, so you would pull it out and you run it through a heat exchanger with that. So that air is coming out. Well, if it's in the summer, it's, you know, say 72, 75 degrees, it's 95 outside. So you put that through an air to air heat exchanger and you pre cool the fresh air with the leaving air. And so instead of bringing in 95 degree air to your refrigeration system, Maybe you can bring in 86 degree air. Well, that's, that's a big deal, capacity wise and energy wise. So see, that's that, what, what that energy recovery ventilator is doing for you. It's just a heat exchanger where you can reduce the loads on your HVAC equipment by working on that outside air coming in before you just dump it onto your coils, okay? Uh, cooling towers, we'll talk, I've got some other slides on cooling towers. <clears throat> they dump the, uh, the, white, the heat from the building to the environment and they get used with chill water systems. So we're showing some chillers down here in the basement. We've got air handling equipment that would have coils in it, duct work to distribute air. Uh, we may have some supplemental coils out in here as well. So we'll see some more. So this is not the best of pictures, I guess. Okay, there's a lot on this one. <clears throat> uh, can y'all see that pretty well? I hope. Okay, well, so this would be for an example of uh, some pretty big equipment in a big building, or this, this could even apply to like Tennessee Tech campus, okay? So we could start over here. These would be our AHU, these would be an air handling unit, okay? And its purpose is to provide, you know, cold air in the summertime and warm, hot air in the wintertime, okay? So, and now, <clears throat> so each space, let's say we've got a bunch of offices that are being conditioned. So there would be an office that's served by this, box, an office by this box, and this could be a long duct. I mean, we could have, you know, 20, 30 offices picked up off of this same unit. So if it's the summertime, we've got cold, dry air up here in the duct under some pressure, you know, so it'll flow. You know, we got a fan back here pushing it, okay? So, well, what kind of temperatures do you expect? So for air conditioning, we're gonna be looking at probably 54 
maybe 52 is starting to get really cold because what happens is if you don't insulate really well, you'll get condensate on the outside of the duct, you know? So you got to insulate and if the insulation's, it's hard to get perfect insulation. So any, any of the outside air on the outside of the duct which is typically warm and fairly moist gets up against that cold duct surface, the moisture condenses and it drips. The insulation gets wet. So I guess they changed over there in the Denso room. If you looked up on the ceiling, if you got ceiling tiles, you can always look up because I always want to put the HVAC equipment above the ceiling tiles. And so you can look for the water spots on the ceiling tiles. And there was, a, there, there was some in there now. They may have stripped all that out, I don't know. I think they did, I think it looks like this now. I think they stripped the drop ceiling out. But anytime you got a drop ceiling, you can usually find the units by look for, look for the little brown water spots. And that's usually where the units are. Or I mean, it could, be, it could be bad pipe insulation or it could be bad duct insulation or something like that. You got condensate forming. Okay, so VAV box. VAV stands for variable air volume. So in the world of HVAC, kind of the old cheap way to do it was a constant air volume system. Fan comes on, blows the same amount of air, thermostat gets satisfied, thing shuts down. Kind of like at your house or your apartment. Okay, that's, a, that's cheap, <clears throat> not very sophisticated control, but cheap is good, especially for the landlord who had to, who had to pay for that stuff, okay? Uh, variable air volume, what it tries to do is each, each box is controlled by a thermostat. So that may be supply in my office and I got a thermostat and it controls that volume damper. And so that volume damper opens and shuts, but it always provides some air and that air provides ventilation, okay? If you're doing a constant volume system and you're starting and stopping the fan, when the fan stops, the ventilation stops. Well, that's not good. So some of those then, if it's a commercial space, might blow all the time, but they start and stop the compressor, which starts and stops the cooling or the heating, you know? But you blow, but, but so then you blow cold air or warm air and, and then, you know, when the thermostat says it needs cooling again, it kicks on the compressor and then it blows cold air. So you're cycling that. Well, this VAV box, we keep about the same conditions in the duct and we simply, the thermostat modulates this damper, which then adjusts, keeps the, the temperature in the space nice and happy. So it's a more sophisticated, it's a better arrangement. And as these uh, throttle back, we can, if we have what we call a variable frequency drive on the fan, we can adjust the fan speed back, you know, when it's not so hot outside, maybe it's 82 instead of 95, so we don't need so much air, and that saves fan energy. So that's what, that's, and if you don't know what a variable frequency drive is, you will soon because you'll have a YouTube video on it coming, okay. So it allows this, it allows a constant speed motor to run at variable speeds and as you slow it down, you save significant amounts of energy. Whoops, didn't want that. Okay, so I mean, so we blow air into the space. So this is cold air in a duct and then each one of these controls air that goes into a particular office or uh, that, that sort of thing, space that's being conditioned. Uh, and then we have return air. So we want to return and we want to only use the minimum ventilation air. Ventilation air is expensive in the summertime. When it's zero degrees outside, ventilation air is expensive because it has to be heated up to 70 degrees. Well, return air, you know, if I'm air conditioning, that return air is gonna be what? 78, 80? That outside air might be 95. <laughs> I don't want any more of that outside air than the ventilation code tells me I have to have. Now with COVID, good Lord, who knows what the impact that COVID is gonna have on all these, um, situ all, all these codes and requirements. But so we're gonna return air. <clears throat> and then we have the ability to dump some of that air with dampers outside. Or, and, but generally we would return the majority of it. Yes. Air, 
Um, yeah, well, ooh, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It depends on the, it depends on your utility rates. Because, okay, like say, if, you're, you, if you have a centrifugal chiller, that's a great question. That's a, that's a super good question. If you have a centrifugal chiller, it has a coefficient of performance. You remember what a COP is from your thermal. Okay, so let's say I needed, uh, I don't know, a million BTUs per hour of cooling. If the COP is six, I get to divide that by six, and that's the number of units of electricity I have to put in because I get six to one on a COP. On a heating side, you know, if you're using, let's say like TTUs burning natural gas, making steam, delivering steam over here. We've got converters that make hot water. The hot water goes through that thing over there. That's our conditioning unit and we get heat. So there's no COP on a boiler, right? The boiler efficiency takes pretty good. I'd say it's 80%. We got a new boiler over there. It's pretty darn good. So if I need a million BTUs, if I divide that by 0.8, what is that? 1.2 million, whatever. I don't, I've got my calculator here. Uh, oh, B. Sorry, I had knee replacement back in December and I'm still a little clunky here. Divided by 0.8. Yeah, that's a million 250,000. So you got no COP. But what's the cost of natural gas compared to the cost of electricity? Ah, so I would say tech is probably paying seven cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, so if you take a million and I divide it by 3413, that's the conversion between kilowatt hours and BTUs times 0.07. That's $20.51 a million for electricity, store one. But let's say, let's say I got a COP of five, that's probably more realistic, divided by five. So that's $4.10 a million, store two. Okay, I don't know what tech's paying. A lot, a lot of big users are paying four bucks. Three, three and a half, three and a half to four and a half bucks per million. Let's say we're paying, if we're paying four at tech, four divided by 0.8, that's $5. So that would say I'm probably a little bit more expensive on heating energy. But you see, you got to go through all that. It depends. They call that the spark spread the difference between the natural gas price and the electric price put in the same units. Because you just can't say seven cents a kilowatt hour versus $4 a million BTUs for gas. And then you got to take the efficiency of the boiler into consideration. And that steam system has some losses, other losses. So I, I would say probably uh, heating based on tech stuff so long as the chillers are working at a five COP. But it's relatively close for, for those numbers. What do we got? What time, will, no, we, we go to 1050, okay. okay. So I get to ramble some more. <clears throat> okay, well, let's, do, let's just look at our air handling unit here. You know, we got our supply duct, we got our cold dry air, we got our VAV boxes. Uh, what do we got there? That's a temperature and relative humidity probe. You know, that's part of the control system on the air handling unit. We got a fan, it's speed controlled, which is good. We've got coils for heating or cooling. We've got a filter, you know, we wanna keep all the crud and particulates. These days we may have some UV lights to kill COVID and other stuff. That's probably, I'll tell you what, that'd be a good business to be in right now. Man, making UV disinfectant systems for coils, I bet you can't make them fast enough. I bet you can't make them fast enough. 
my goodness, like, and like these little things that we stick in the back of the classroom that make so much noise, you know, that's, man, you just, it's amazing. Okay, so here's our return. And we're showing, so if it's a big system, it probably has a return fan as well to, to blow the air back. So this fan is sucking it out of the space up through the grill into the return duct, blowing it back. We got uh, dampers to uh, control the amount of return. And then this would be the outside air coming in from outside. Louvers there. Again, we're gonna, we're gonna measure that temperature and relative humidity that's coming in from outside. <clears throat> then they would mix. So see, this is supply air, this is return air, this is outside air, and this is mixed air. So those are the, you know, the designations that we talk about. Uh, we got some valves to control the amount of heating or cooling, controlled by the control system, that sort of thing. So that's pretty much an air handler. Oh, we're gonna measure the temperature relative humidity of the return as well. So that's all pretty simple. So we've got, you know, a big system could have multiple, multiple air handlers just handling different spaces. Like uh, in this building, the fourth floor has what we call a dual duct, a central system. And then I think all the way down through the building, we have these individual smaller units. Like these are called unit, that's called a unit ventilator for each classroom. I've got Dr. Languria and I share a little box, a little fan coil box that hangs up inside his office. I've got the, I've got the controls and he's got the unit. <laughs> so if he makes me mad, I just, you know, change the settings on the controls and then go home and lock the door. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right. Okay. So let's go over and look over here a little bit. So this, th this little box right here, this little dotted in box represents one water chiller. That's one centrifugal chiller. Okay, well, that's just a refrigeration system. And you remember from your thermo, a refrigeration system is what? A compressor, a condenser coil, an expansion device, and an evaporator. And the refrigerant, round and, round and around she goes, you know? It's what, hot superheated vapor coming out of the compressor. It goes into the condenser. We condense it at high pressure to a liquid. We put it through an expansion valve, drop pressure. We get two phase, mostly liquid, but some vapor and it's cold because that's what refrigerants do. When, when they're liquid high pressure, you drop pressure, they get cold. It might be 38, you know, it can't be below 32 or we're gonna start free unless we got glycol in it. So we're gonna start freezing water. So if, if they're just handling water, then it's gotta be 30, 37, 38, something like that refrigerant and then it goes into the evaporator that's where the cooling effect occurs and we boil that refrigerant back into the superheated vapor state at low pressure and it goes back into the compressor round and around she goes so that that refrigerant doesn't mix with whatever it is we're making cold and so in a chiller in a big system like this we're making water we have chilled water so we're gonna make that water at tech, it's probably about 42 degrees over there in the chiller plant. You know, 40 degrees is pretty darn cold. 42 to 44, and then say, but they're gonna make it 42 over there because they gotta pump it all over campus. That water goes underground from the chiller plants down that way, all the way to Derryberry and I'm not sure what happened. I guess it probably goes to the boiler house, you know, over there towards Spanky's. It goes to the dorms. It goes everywhere, you know, and so it's gonna pick up some heat. It's gonna go through the pumps and the pumping energy is gonna heat it up a little bit. And then the insulation is not perfect. So it's probably gonna be 44, 45 before it gets to Brown Hall and some of these other places, okay? But so, so we, we're showing there's, there's our return water coming back from the building. So return water is gonna come back 52, 54, something like that. And then we're gonna cool it down to, we're, we're shooting for a 10 to 12 degree Delta T on the chiller. So say if we're 42 at full load, if we're 42 out of the chiller, 
we're looking at probably 12 degree delta T. So what is that, 52, 54 on the return, something like that. And see, that's an issue. You can't load a chiller if you can't get warm water back to it. And so a lot of systems, there's a problem, it's called the low delta T problem on chillers. That'd be another good YouTube video for me to send. <laughs> I got a lot of work to do on YouTube, don't I? <laughs> but uh, if, if, if you have a system and you're not, you're not taking enough heat out of the water, let's say you expect a 12 degree delta T and you put 48 degree water in that chiller and it can only produce 42 degree water you're only getting half, you're only getting six degrees. That's only half of the capacity of the chiller. So depending on your piping and your control system, you got to make sure that you get warm enough water back to the chiller that you can actually load the chiller. So that's something we talk more about all this crap later. Um, so, you know, we got our warm water coming back 54. What's this little sideways Z about? Anybody, anybody ever seen one of those before? That's a, is that a lazy Z ranch because it's laying on its side? <laughs> now, that's a check valve. And we'll talk more about this, but when you put in pumps, let's say you turn this pump off and you don't have a check valve, you might, if this, if this line over here is pressurized, you might allow water to flow backwards through the pump because the pump's off. So a check valve doesn't allow water to flow backwards when you like turn a pump off. Check valves are, ex <laughs> I mean, it's a simple idea, but you, you could screw up some, I mean, you know, think about it. You got a big tank up on the hill, let's say you have a water tower or something and you pump water up there all night long to fill up the tower and you turn the pump off. If you don't have a check valve on that line, as soon as you turn the pump off, the water flows all the way back down to wherever it wanted, wherever it can go. You go, well, crap, that didn't work very well. <laughs> so if you're filling water towers, for sure, you wanna have check valves. It becomes obvious very quickly when you, if you turn on a system, it's supposed to have a check valve and it does it. And when they turn it off and all of a sudden, <laughs> where'd my water go? It's gone. Okay, so yeah, these are just chill water pumps pumping down through here. So we're showing what? One, two, three chillers. Oh, I can't hardly read that. Uh, we can talk about bypasses and stuff like that. Expansion tank, uh, any of these water loops, you know, you fill it, you, when you have the temperature changes, the water expands or contracts, especially in heating side, but even in chill water systems. And if, you know, like if you fill a pipe completely with water and heat it up, guess what? <laughs> It's going to expand and you're going to have some serious pressure in that pipe if you don't have an expansion tank for it to expand into. So this handles expansion contraction of water in the system. Um, and then the, th these are called chiller pumps. They just circulate water through the chillers. And these are your distribution pumps called secondary pumps. And these are the bigger pumps that pump it on out through the air handlers. And we'll go visit the tech chiller plant. This is the way the tech chillers are set up as well. Tech now has four big chillers down there. Their load, you know, this new building, on the, between the new fitness center and this new building, the, I think the tech, the, the campus uh, uh, cooling load increased by about 33%. I mean, it was, I mean, you know, go look at that building, <laughs> crap. That's a big building over there. And that fitness center is pretty big too. Because they, they've just recently put all that stuff on the system. Now we're not doing much cooling. I mean, we do run chillers all year round because interior spaces, that's something else we didn't talk about in the introduction. If I have a big building, like probably areas in Derryberry and all that stuff, that building is so massive and it has interior spaces those interior spaces never know that it's cold outside because they're surrounded by conditioned space. So it can be zero degrees outside and a completely interior space. If it has 70, if it's surrounded by 70 degrees, how does that space ever know that it's zero degrees outside? The only communication it would have would be through potentially ventilation air. So there would be a little bit there, but you know, 
for an overall space, that's pretty small. So, you know, big buildings, high rise buildings, um, some of the big buildings in Nashville, it'd be really cold outside and you see the plumes coming off of the top of the building. Those are the cooling towers because they're running chillers because that central core of that building has to have air conditioning all the time that it's occupied because they got lights and people and computers and all that stuff generating heat. And it's gonna get hot even when it's so, so long as the rest of the building is conditioned. Okay. Okay, well, that's pretty good on this one. How we doing? And these are just some, uh, some of this stuff is we've probably talked through the majority of it. This just shows a particular, a smaller air handling system. I don't know how to make this ribbon go away. Does anybody know how to make that ribbon go away? I don't know. Anyway, something I have to learn about Zoom. But so this is an air handler. You know, we got a fan. Uh, we got heat and coils, cooling coils, filters. There's a mixed air sensor. Uh, in, in a control system, you can have a digital and analog inputs and outputs. So a digital is a two position switch. It's like yes or no, on or off. Analog is like, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna measure temperature, you gotta have an analog, you know, cause as it's saying, you know, it was a continuous stream of information in as, as it changes. So you can see there's an outside air sensor. It's an analog input to, to the controller. Um, we've got a workstation, a computer that's talking to the controller. Uh, condition space sensor, analog input. Here's a digital output going to the uh, fan motor starter. So when you start the fan, you just push it, it starts and then you're done, it's running. So that's kind of what that's all about. You can see what's analog and what's digital. Uh, damper motor or damper positioning. I think that's pretty good on that. Okay, some cool stuff on here. So this is kind of like one of these, you know, state of the art kind of buildings. And let's just look at some of the, uh, the components that, that are noted as going into this fairly futuristic fairly modern looking building. Well, building automation system, that's the automatic control system. So you would expect any good sized building today to have a building automation system. Uh, you know, they talk about net zero buildings, which may, may mean they need net zero energy. And so one thing you could do, you could put in uh, solar water heaters. If, they, if you had a gymnasium or pe people showering, um, you could put in solar photovoltaic and actually generate, you know, cover the roof with solar panels. Or if you've got a field out to the side, you could put in uh, PV panels to generate electricity and potentially battery storage if you can, if you have enough money. Um, three, high performance operable windows. How many high rise buildings these days have operable windows? Not very many. You know, so it would, it would depend on the climate. You know, in Nashville, that, that could be something to think about because there are a fair number of hours per year where you could, you know, which, what if it's 50, 55, 60 degrees outside, if you had an office with an operable, you could crack the window open and take care of a lot of your conditioning. Now, there are things called, um, Economize your cycles, which we'll talk about on the air handlers. I'm not gonna, I'll do my econom, economizer tirade uh, next time, which will relate to this. Uh, rainwater collection and filtration system. So what could you use rainwater? Let's say you collect all of the rainwater that hits on the roofs of these buildings and sometimes even parking areas and covered parking garages and stuff. What could you use that water for? What's that? I'm sorry. I can't. No, it's not refrigeration, but irrigation, because we usually have plants and stuff and we'll have a, you know, they'll have grass and all that stuff. And they'll have an irrigation system where they just take water and just, you know, water the plants and the shrubs and the bushes. 
So that's one thing. The other thing is you can pipe it to the toilets and urinals. And when you flush, you don't have to have, you know, processed, drinkable water to put in a toilet. Well, so that's another, you know, you can put in what's called a gray water system. And you can put in, it, now it's, it's extra cost because you have to put in extra piping. You have to collect it. And then you have to have, this is number seven, storm water infiltration pit. So you would collect storm water and you would have uh, a pit or tanks where you store that gray water and then pump it up to all of the, the, uh, the, the, those fixtures that are gonna use it. So you can do that. Uh, geothermal heat exchanger. I've got another slide on that. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay, this is, and I put an extra little tag up here. This is what we would call a direct expansion package unit. Okay, so direct expansion, we kind of have in, in cooling equipment, we kind of have two types. We have chilled water equipment, which is what we have here, because it actually gets chilled water from the chiller plant. Or we have direct expansion, which means that the actual refrigerant goes through the core. So this type of a unit has a compressor, it has a condenser coil, it has an evaporator, it has an expansion. And so it's direct expansion, meaning that the refrigerant is what is directly doing the cooling in the coil. It's, it doesn't have this intervening, you know, like the water chiller has refrigerant, it makes cold water and the cold water comes into the unit and actually does, is what goes through the coral and the unit that does the cooling. So now this will be a little more efficient because every time you pass that off to another fluid, you're gonna have losses, you know? So this is a little better, but if you're gonna do a huge campus, you would have so many of these things that you would never be able to maintain them. Each building might have 20 of those. So you might have 200 or 500 of these units. They all get to be 10 to 20 years old, you know, like things that tech do or 30 or 40 years old. They're all falling apart. No, 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 no. We can't go down that road, you know. So large institutions want to go with large chillers where they can just pump water. And then each air handler is much simpler device. Say so this all, what do you got? You got coils, valves, controls. It's a whole lot less to maintain on that than there is on this. But if you look around town, if you drive around, look up on top, sometimes you'll just see a box up on top. It probably has a, a, one or a number of package units setting up there and it doesn't have a water chiller. Because chill, chill water systems are expensive. Because you gotta buy chillers, you gotta buy you know, it could be an air-cooled chiller. If it's a water-cooled chiller, you have to buy a cooling tower and you got maintenance and all that sort of thing. So big, the big guys go ahead and they have to incur that expense. Small individual buildings out around town, maybe 20, 30,000 square feet can get by on DX type equipment. Speaking of centrifugal, uh, water, and this is a water cool chiller. And so what we've got, um, which one of these, this is coming up. So this is the evaporator down here because this is showing vapor coming up into the compressor. So your chill water would come in one of these pipes and go out the other pipe. And then the hot gases go down to the condenser over here and your cooling tower water, your condenser water would go in one of these pipes and out of one of these pipes. That's a much more detailed breakdown on a chiller. Uh, man, there's stuff in here that I don't know what is. I'll probably figure out most of it, but anyway. So here's your evaporator. <clears throat> here's your refrigerant vapor coming up to the compressor. It's compressed, it goes up to the condenser. Again, you've got your condenser water to from the cooling tower coming in, condensing this. We go through some uh, expansion valves. We get that uh, 
mostly liquid, low pressure, a little bit of vapor down in here in the evaporator and the chill water, the return water comes in at 54 and goes out at 42, something like that. So, uh, picture of a cooling tower. This typically set out, or well, they're gonna sit outside someplace, have access to a lot of outside air. Uh, they work by evaporation is the primary mechanism. Um, so that, that water coming out of the condenser, it's a little bit, it's coming in this pipe and it's distributed up in top. There's basins up here. There's a basin here and a basin, well, I guess we're just showing one on this one. And there's little holes called nozzles in here. This water falls down through the fill and air is drawn across. We have a propeller fan that operates that pulls air across. And so this would be a cross flow uh, tower uh, induced draft because the, the fan is on this side, sucking the air through. You can have force draft towers where the fans on the other side. This is probably the most common type. <clears throat> so the water comes across and evaporates. I mean, the air comes across, the water's falling down. It evaporates a little bit of the water that cools down the airflow, or it cools down the water, sorry. And then the water falls down in the bottom and then is pumped back to the chiller and it just runs around in a circle. We have to continually add some uh, water, makeup water to this because it's evaporating a little bit. Okay, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. I'm starting to get tongue tied and we're just about done with time. So um, be looking, I'll send you an email with some YouTube links I want you to watch. So. We'll watch for next time. We'll probably do two classes and then we'll have a quiz. So just be watching them. They, they won't be all that much, but just watch them a couple times and start to you know, get yourself acclimated to the, to the subject, okay? I appreciate your kind attention and we will continue this next time. Uh, let's see. That's not true. Okay, that was just on my head.